It's done? Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Hong. I'm the next speaker. I'm from Red Hat. First off, I'm going to give a shout out to the whole Force Asia Summit team. Thank you for doing this, guys. Thank you for uh, uh, sticking, uh, standing by us, uh, the open source community. Uh, thank you for the audience, no matter where you are, uh, the folks in the room, you know who you are, the two of you. Uh, <laughs> so, unprecedented times. Uh, so the, uh, I guess this leads to unprecedented uh, uh, technology topic up next. So let's begin. We're going to talk about microservices. We're going to talk about not how you should be developing microservices, but how you should be actually be deploying it, securing it, using um, state of the art, state of the art free open source uh, project called Istio to help you in um, achieving that. So, yes, shameless advertising, courtesy of Red Hat. We have a technology uh, which has Istio baked underneath. We call it OpenShift Service Mesh. So bear in mind that we'll be talking a whole lot of about uh, um, open source technologies in the next few minutes uh, rather than a product. But we need to talk about the concept of a microservice mesh, otherwise known as a service mesh. Why is this important? Why can't we just run a microservice as it is? Um, maybe that will bring into mind the complexity of a, uh, a business application. Uh, nowadays, when you develop it based on uh, standard microservice frameworks, um, can you make it easier to consume by business users? Allah, this is what Istio is supposed to do, right? So we'll talk about all the various implementations of Istio across the competitive landscape. A Red Hat OpenShift service mesh is not alone in that landscape. Uh, we have a uh, cool topology, so as to speak, where we separate two levels of concern. One is a data plane, the other is the control plane. What are they? Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Why do we want to split them up into two tiers? Uh, what is in Istio? specifically, and very importantly, in the control plane, because that's where all that meat, the juicy meat is in, right? And finally, of course, best practices of deploying microservices, we take into consideration north-south traffic as well as east-west traffic. What am I talking about? Is it traffic on the uh, Singapore map, uh, north-south being Central Expressway and east-west being uh, Penn Island Expressway? We'll get to that. <coughs> so what is? an open standards-based microservice mesh, otherwise known as a service mesh. It's meant uh, to enforce a set of business as well as technical policies. Yes, it's policy enforcement, number one. The whole idea here is it enforces policies on behalf of the stakeholders, the business stakeholders. Do they want certain microservices to cons be consumed in this fashion? Do they want to have a certain uh, pattern of consumption? Or do they want to have certain kinds of uh, consumption modes to be, to be banned altogether? Certain microservices should not be called in such a way. You're supposed to have the right uh, certificates before you start making requests to my microservice. So it, takes about, it talks about connectivity. Here's a very interesting topic, uh, connectivity tissue, or otherwise known as the fabric of connectivity between microservices in a certain environment. The mesh is supposed to uh, uh, safeguard that sort of uh, uh, connectivity. At the same time, it adds on top of those policies I mentioned, traffic control, oh, sorry about that, <coughs> traffic control, Load balancing, resiliency, observability, security. Very importantly as well is offloading uh, the what you used to do as a full stack developer. Oh, maybe some of us are not full stack, that's fine. Microservice developer, where you try to bake everything into the app. It offloads those concerns regarding network connectivity, traffic policy management, off off the app onto the infrastructure. Very importantly as well, it also uh, enhances the capabilities um, 
of the underlying container platform. That's right. In Red Hat, what we do with Istio is we build a uh, product called OpenShift Service Mesh. Underlying it is our uh, 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 productized, co containerized environment called Kubernetes. It's productized and therefore it's called OpenShift Container Platform. So the four various use cases typically there are uh, adoption models for Istio uh, uh, consumption, for Istio consumption would be connect, control, security, and observability. Uh, oh, what does that keep coming out? All right, let's try this one. Mm -hmm. There you go, much better. Uh -huh. And that would be uh, the four usual concerns whenever you deploy a microservice, whenever you deploy a web app. Right, so let's go back to the traditional application server. Um, back then, when there was no uh, microservice, there was no concept of a microservice mesh. You could just run your app on the application server. The world was simple, right? Well, it wasn't. It was just complex. But we baked everything into a complex stack. So we call this the application stack. Now, the, the danger here is that you have the overly, um, I think, overly complex monolith app. Thus, eventually it came to the point where the microservice uh, 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 industry evolved into open standards based frameworks. The likes of, you may have heard of Vertex, Quarkus, Spring Boot, right? And now I might be even talking about a mesh because there are way too many services out there in your operating environment that you want to uh, 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 safeguard access uh, two, at the same time having some visibility into the traffic, the data packets, which is why it makes sense in this operating environment full of microservices, wrap a mesh around it, right? That's probably what your microservice to microservice interaction looks like today. We call this sort of traffic east-west, Pan Island Expressway, folks that live in Singapore. <coughs> Uh, so, where microservices are interacting with other microservices, that happens a lot. Now, this visits north-south. I will have a, probably a diagram later on, where it's incoming traffic through an ingress proxy. Uh, I'm using terms familiar to the Kubernetes world. As you know, Kubernetes is one of the hottest open source movement right now. And yes, OpenShift Service Mesh is baked uh, uh, on top of that. And we also have a tool which I'll introduce shortly in the API management front that uh, safeguards and uh, secures north-south traffic access. So all these are fallacies. All these are fallacies, right? Remember that uh, chart, the chart that was flipped towards you uh, like 45 seconds ago, the application server full stack? It's a fallacy. It's a fallacy. You cannot rely on the network to do the heavy lifting of forwarding messages to all the microservices. You cannot take it for granted that the backend network topology does not ever change. You cannot even think that transport cost of your UDP or TCP packets are zero cost. At the same time, you cannot assume that the network is homogeneous, that one subnet is the same as another. The underlying infrastructure will change, and which is why there must be some layer of traffic management on top of the underlying TCP IP infrastructure that has been in place, we take it for granted, that has been in place for decades now. It's changing, it's always changing underneath. It does not have an SLA tied to it, which allows you to safeguard access to certain microservices that your stakeholders demand. That, uh, that uh, those service level agreements pertaining to uh, uh, microservices uh, will be assured day after day, hour after hour. You can't, you can't just delegate it to the internet. You need to have a service mesh layer. So what did Red Hat think of? They think about, number one, what is the hottest service mesh technology out there? Istio. Istio.io. Go to the website at, uh, right now uh, after this. At the same time, what is the hottest container platform out there? Kubernetes. 
So you take the two, meet in the middle, you have OpenShift service mesh. It's basically a containerized service mesh on top of a platform, container platform. So how do you deal with complexity? Once we containerize your microservice, which should be the way, because you could always, if you are a DevOps fan, be rolling out, generating new versions of microservices that rolls out onto our container platform in a containerized format. And at the same time, because the uh, Istio, the service mesh technology is also containerized, it makes perfect sense to share one container, container platform. And of course, this brings to mind the hy hybrid cloud model that do all microservices need to be containerized? Can we just run it on physical? Can we run it on a different cloud? The answer is definitely, of course, yes. Thanks to the concept of microservices framework. It doesn't care what's, microservice A doesn't care what microservice B is running on. That's why there is a framework that allows it to connect. Do they even care what service mesh is governing it? No, they probably, it will be oblivious to them. Which is why Istio is helpful, because it is a evolving project. There's always new contributions on the weekly, I dare not say daily, but it seems to be the case, daily basis, that makes it still stronger and more enhanced as time goes by. With all these features that I'm going to talk, start talking about in greater detail, now, for instance, configuration. One of the key things it still could do is you could actually help config multiple services the way that you, your stakeholders want those services to be consumed. So say, for instance, now you have Spring Cloud Config Server. We're not shy to talk about other technologies apart from Red Hat because we don't live on an island. It's, it's, an, uh, it's definitely a huge ecosystem and Spring Cloud Config Server is popular in configuring multiple Spring Boot microservices. You could use that uh, concept to, uh, at the same time whenever you want to deploy a microservice project. You could be using Netflix, Eureka, and Ribbon. Netflix OSS was one of the first out in the market with a concept of a service mesh and different kinds of service mesh patterns. Uh, right now, we believe there are many, many players in this industry. And at the same time also, you could see service discovery is what Eureka and uh, Ribbon does very, very well. Every time you a uh, DevOps, back to DevOps again, start deploying apps on a uh, repetitive basis. Who knows? Every few hours in a day, a new app is born and is deployed into the operating environment. It's discovered using Eureka Ribbon. Azul, which you may have heard of uh, if you have been a uh, Netflix OSS adopter, I've seen um, the complexity in all the various routing permutations between microservices. You will need a Zool server to help you uh, make sense of that. Circuit breaking is what Zool does do, too. You know, it plays a big part of this. Whenever there is a, a SLA that says, you know, a uh, uh, particular microservice is down, you need to start for failing over, circuit breaking. Place, kicks in and plays a part here. Another reason you use circuit breaking would be because of security. You know that there has been an attack, DDoS attack, malware attack on a particular microservice, time to circuit break. What circuit break means is that it cuts the uh, transmission channel to that particular service that is impacted. Zipkin, who's been using Zipkin. Tracing, which now has gave birth to a community, that concept has gave birth, or that need for tracing has gave birth to a community called Open Tracing. And we have technologies in Red Hat that uh, does precisely that. Jaeger, we use uh, a open source community project called Jaeger, uh, which is one half of Jaeger Meister. Uh, always a good adult beverage. I don't mind saying that. <laughs> I haven't had one for a while. So Jaeger, has been baked into quite a lot of open source products, including our own. So in uh, OpenShift Service Mesh, it is really that go-to technology that is already in, in OpenShift Service Mesh that allows you to look at the uh, uh, traffic data that goes into any portion of the uh, operating environment where microservice that has been, that is currently being governed by OpenShift Service Mesh. Um, what is the traffic like? That's what Jaeger could do. And that's what, uh, um, and another technology, obviously, is Zipkin, which I mentioned very briefly. Skip that. As you know, it's very, very complex, very, very complex in the microservice world. We think it's good to standardize as much as you can. You standardize on the frameworks of microservices. You standardize on the 
format of operating a microservice. Containers, 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 that's, I'm not the first person to use all three words, which is the same word, in repetition, uh, but it's hard, and that is the way you uh, standardize the format of a application being developed, when it's being tested, when it's being developed, and when it's finally deployed. Very importantly as well, the platform, the container platform, the container platform, the container platform. When you have the containers, you need to have a platform to, to govern it, to host it, to make it uh, highly accessible. So what we do in Red Hat OpenShift is that we provide a whole lot of um, developer tooling, uh, not just runtime tooling. Here we're talking about CI, CD pipelines, config management, which I mentioned earlier on. And very importantly as well, how is Istio enjoy the good benefits of OpenShift? Again, containerization. It leverages also not just from the containerization technologies, but security technologies, the config management technologies, the automation technology that you will automate the way microservices are deployed. You could automate the way it still is reconfigured. And you might have to reconfigure every time there is a new operating environment that a new stakeholder would need. Or there have been changes in the uh, scope of work, right? Suddenly the number of the population of microservices just went up 25% and you need to secure it. And this is how you will start securing it from this day on, different from the other days. Again, back to Jaeger, tracing, circuit breaking, routing, service config. Now, instead of getting all these different open source technologies like Spring Boot Config Server, Spring Cloud Config Server, um, all the Netflix OSS uh, goodies, Zool, um, Ribbon, Hystrix, that's for circuit breaking. Yes, definitely Zipkin as well. Um, and we, we now have the equivalent all in one product, so to speak, and uh, thanks to Istio, thanks to Jaeger, all baked into OpenShift Service Mesh. So, lots of vendors are providing this, and uh, here's a brief view of the landscape. Note that Istio has a huge contributor in the form of Red Hat, that's right. We had a big contributor, Istio Project. So what is Istio really all about? It's control, command and control. Command and control using a control plane. And the bottom layer, so think about two tiers. There's probably gonna be at least one more architecture diagram that shows these two tiers. The upper tier, the control plane controls. It has the ability for you to issue commands issue new configuration changes and therefore control the second tier. What's the second tier? The data plane. We're at the top, right under Istio. We call this the Envoy project. You probably have heard of Envoy. Just like what an emissary or ambassador is supposed to do. That's the term Envoy. It's a ambassador or a ambassador-like proxy to an existing microservice. Every single microservice, once it still is installed, has a proxy that listens to it. Mm. How else would you get all the good, juicy Jaeger, I mean, tracing data for Jaeger, right? So you need to have a proxy that issues the, the configuration change requests as what the Istio command and control team or the, the administrator of Istio at the control plane layer would be issuing to the data plane, the Envoy proxies this to the existing microservices. All right? Of course, there are options. Uh, in the industry, I'm not saying this is specific to Red Hat OpenShift, you could switch, for instance, the data plane. We recommend Envoy from Red Hat. Certain customer implementations, who knows? In the industry, is huge and it's evolving, it's so exciting. They might want to switch out Envoy for the fastest web server out there in the market, Nginx. And even here in Red Hat, we use Nginx to build some of our technologies. Remember the north-south traffic? Who, rather than who, what do you think manages that? We believe a API management platform should be, should do the trick. It should be the right candidate to manage that. And you know what? Three-scale API management, which is from Red Hat, is baked uh, with Nginx uh, engine um, well, underneath. So this is the architecture. You could get it from istio.io, and you could see what I just described from the ambassadorial point of view. The proxy, it sits next to the services. 
And the whole idea here is that it propagates any configuration changes that the control plane team might be issuing, and there might be so many that is always being uh, issued, to underlying, I know I flipped it, right? The SDO team like to flip it. They put a control plane underneath, should just put the control plane up on top. That's what I just said a few minutes ago, control plane sits on top of the data plane, but it's flipped a little bit to emphasize that we care about the microservice first. That's right, microservice first. That's what the Istio community cares about. It ain't just about the control plane. It's flipped upside down because the health of the microservice comes first. So therefore, whenever there's any configuration management change request, goes through, number one, obviously the different parts of the control plane. Here we have different cool sounding names that uh, wants to sound like a naval you know, um, enthusiasts or, or some, some kind of sailing enthusiast, pilot galley and mixer, and it goes eventually up into uh, the data layer, all right? So data layer, data plane. It is a collection of service proxies. It is meant for you to implement these policies and communicate directly one-to-one, -one, one Envoy uh, uh, entity to one microservice. So. Envoy, default service proxy, like I said, can be always be swapped out. Um, but very importantly, why Envoy? This is the rest out in the market. C++, it is one of the highly uh, 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 performing proxy entities out there because it has support for HTTP2 uh, and gRPC. It makes it very suitable. It has very fast communication with the uh, service endpoints. Now, let's talk about the control plane. All those cool sounding naval terms or sailing terms, right? Uh, it is the single point of administration whenever an administer, uh, administrator wants to affect changes. They don't go straight to any other plane, not data plane, definitely the control plane, right? And uh, what uh, it is meant to do is that the service proxies require all these change requests sent by the control plane to be updated, right? And very importantly, it combines all the isolated stateless sidecar proxies into a single service mesh. That's a secret is still. Very importantly as well, we keep talking about um, the traffic that uh, is collected by the control plane on behalf of uh, individual services when it's aggregated. These are known as telemetry data, telemetry data. Okay, so individual control plane um, um, entities, pilot, what does it do? Well, it basically configures the underlying data plane. It converts the high level routing rules, controls the traffic behavior, just like this. So it has the technology to propagate any of the configuration change requests down to the data layer. Citadel, as the term might indicate, it's a bastion of sorts, so it's meant to safeguard against intrusion. So it is the security entity in Istio, and it is meant to enforce based on microservice identity rather than you know, network identities. What's a typical network identity? IP address, host name? No, we're talking about service identities. So there would be a set of security policies associated to one service, Istio, uh, uh, affects that, enforces that policy. Galley, sounds like a ship. So, um, somewhere would be the repository of all your configuration policies. Somewhere will be the ingestion engine for all the telemetry data, that's Galley. And somewhere you need to insulate, in, 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 in some sense a buffer, right, that insulates all the other in-steel in components like Citadel and Pilot away from the underlying platform. Guess what it is? OCP, OpenShift Container Platform, and that's Galley's job. How about Mixer? You know, sounds, like, sounds like a drink again, right? So it's a Friday, it's, it's the afternoon, and uh, keep talking about uh, dropping all these hints about uh, um, beverages. Well, Mixer is a very important bridge between the data plane and the control plane. It's an abstraction layer. Well, it's an ab abstraction entity. I won't call it a layer. It belongs in a control plane. The idea is that all your various backends, Envoy, which right now we standardize on Envoy, 
uh, would have some means of, um, or is devoid, actually the, the back end is devoid of some means of precondition checking. Example, quota checks. Example, how you would retrieve and aggregate telemetry data and prepare it for a reporting framework to consume it. The likes of maybe Kiali. Have you heard Kiali? K-I-A. Li, the likes of a Kibana dashboard. We like Kiali. We like Kibana too, but this is probably more on the OpenShift container platform layer, and Kiali is more on the service mesh. We'll talk about that offline if dashboarding is really interesting to you. Um, important thing here is there must be some form of all these precondition checking, quota checks, uh, data preparation. That's what Mixer does. Mixer is really the abstraction interface. Mixer is also available in tree scale API management, which I mentioned was the go-to um, um, solution for safeguarding north-south ingress, egress and ingress traffic into a operating environment. Um, why? Because you need to have some sort of a abstraction um, layer, a adapter going into the data plane. So you could see here at the bottom what I wrote, uh, is that the use of adapters, there's, there's at least one uh, from the Mixer community um, as a form of an integration bridge. And here you can see where Mixer plays a huge role. With all that rich API that I talked about, logging, quota backend checks, authorization, yes, authorization is what Mixer does as well. It serves as a bridge from control plane to the data plane. A few version numbers just to toss out. OpenShift Service Mesh currently supports uh, Istio upstream 1.1.x as we speak. Um, it is supported on OpenShift Container Platform 4. All right. Um, here, very importantly, also you have the multi tenancy highlight of OpenShift Service Mesh, highlight of, of course, Istio implementations on top of Kubernetes. I'm not saying that there is no one out there in the market trying to do the same. Get is still to run on top of a container platform, but why would they want to do that? Why? Goodness sakes, why would they want to go through all that hard work when Red Hat has done it? Now, the reason, multi-tenancy, at least at the top of the list of priorities of them doing it, achieve multi-tenancy. Imagine now you have multi-tenancy for both control plane and data plane. Wow. You could be getting... For instance, your services provider, I'm not saying a telecommunication service provider, but maybe they should be considering this. And you allow, say, your other corporate uh, clients, clientele, to get on board, say, a containerized Istio environment. Could be OpenShift Service Mesh. And then each of them, being a tenant, play a role in safeguarding access or affecting configuration changes, putting in all these policies on behalf of their own clientele, their own Customers, what do we have? We have the makings of an ecosystem, right? For whichever, telecommunications industry, maybe financial, uh, it becomes an ecosystem. An ecosystem where anyone with great ideas want to get on top of, say, a microservice framework on, uh, on top of a, uh, say, a Kubernetes platform, could start deploying it really, really quickly. Uh, well, bear, uh, I would not want you to bear with me with some of the Kubernetes related Terminology, so I'm moving really quick, almost to the end, almost there. North, south, and east, west. So what's so cool about API management playing a big role in north, south traffic management? Now think about egress and ingress, and you probably have different kinds of architectures in your mind. The most popular one is on the left-hand side, there's traffic coming in, and the right-hand side, there's traffic going out. All right, that's, that's typical north, south. Now the question here is, question here is, who are we dealing with? We're dealing with the humble microservice. A single technical operation, business operation baked into a piece of code like Spring Boot. Question. Now you have a million microservices, not just one. Who are we dealing with? It sounds like a, a, a whole lot of uh, um, operational interfacing. Every single microservice, even though it's a single business op, has a uh, has a exposed um, um, uh, interface, operational interface. 
Does that sound like an API? That typically is an API. The best form of communication with that sort of a service, a microservice, is through an API. Now you have a million of it. So that means you have a million entries in your Swagger document. You've heard of Swagger document, right? It's one of the most popular um, 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 format for describing services, a, a la APIs. So now that was just a million definitions or a million definitions on the interface side. And how about runtime? So in real time, runtime, you might be, depending on popularity of these services, looking at times two, times three, times four, amount of traffic going in to the service layer. So chances are this is getting more complex than it should. Time to introduce an API management layer. So the Red Hat has a recommendation for that. It's called three scale API management. So it's concerning north-south ingress and egress traffic. How about east-west, Pan, Pan Island Expressway? Um, simple. Between each microservice, and there's a million of it still at my, uh, still at my uh, analogy, imagine the num number of permutations between all these microservices. Microservices do make microservice calls. So, Rephrase that, microservices do make calls to other microservices. So you need to be concerned about intra and operating environment traffic. That will be east and west. Intra, not just inter, right? not just egress, ingress. So we have the capabilities of that. We believe a mix of the service mesh as well as the API management platform will do the trick. Both of which would have the means of observability, security, Right, resiliency as well. Oh, did I not mention chaos testing? So in Netflix, there's one tool they call it Chaos Monkey. What a name! That's really cool. All right. So we believe there's also other tools out there that does chaos testing. Right. We we'll keep the presentation short, but that's a great topic. We could talk at length. So chaos testing against your targeted microservice backend should be a very important phase of your microservice development lifecycle. There I said it, SDLC-wise, testing is important. Test, test, test. And not just any test, shake it all up, see if any of those service, inter-service connections or intra-service connections break. Because if they do, that's good. And the next thing is, if they break, do they survive the failure? It's not good enough to say it's good, it's, break, it's broken. You, you, you must have a means of surviving a failure. So service mesh is supposed to kick in a pattern called circuit breaker, a la Netflix OSS, right? Hystrix. So you must have a means of kicking an equivalent of a circuit breaker in, which means there will be a failover target for the broken inter-service uh, con connectivity channel. Did it kick in in time? Did it affect any of the SLAs that put in place on behalf of the stakeholders? So talk about stakeholders. They are not born equal. It depends on, well, it depends on simply or what do they want out of the uh, engagement experience? Do they want high SLAs? Do they want low? Do they, are they just okay with middle of the road? So there comes in mind tiering of customers and users. Remember the telco example I gave? Great example. Greater implementation, get them all into different tiers. Gold, platinum, silver, bronze. It's something TreeScale is familiar with, the API management product I just talked about. And it's also something that the service mesh world is beginning to get, get a hang of. Which, in other words, getting different tiering in place, a la if you want the highest availability for your million microservice operating environment, not only how much, I know money is going to be the next topic, how much are you willing to pay for? The next thing would be, how do you want to do it? How would you want to get that 99.9% .9 availability SLA up? Certain kind of configuration changes you want to make through the mix that I just talked about using Pilot and Mixer. How about security? How, what kind of level of security do you want? So. Bear in mind different, peer, different tiers, solves the, solves the um, issue of um, having um, um, different SLAs, right? You put that in place. So that's it. Any questions?
Otherwise, feel free to contact me through any of these channels. That's it. Uh, I actually have nothing else, and this is actually my last presentation for Red Hat this month. So thank you, everybody.